Hello and welcome to the lecture Comedy in the Community. To quickly introduce myself, my name is Alice Frick. I am a stand-up comedian, a writer, a producer, a vlogger and also a workshop facilitator. My background is I studied at the Vienna University of Economics and Business and I got my MBA there and also I studied at the University of Essex for my MA acting. So basically business and acting, those two things together brought me literally into stand-up comedy. Then we also have here today Lynn Ruth Miller. My photo was quite serious. She's, <laughs> we got a funny photo from her. She's uh, the oldest female comedian actually. She's 86 years old and she's a stand-up comedian, a writer and a painter. We will meet her at the end of the lesson when she, uh, she there is a short session with her for Q&A. And her background is she got an MA in Creative Arts for Children and an MA in Communications at Stanford University. To start off with, I just want to show you a few street signs. So here we can see most of them, I think, are from the States. These signs about the speed. One says speed limit 69 and then you can see just kidding 35. Or here we have one speed bumps ahead with the sign underneath when children are present and maybe this one on the right side you have seen in the train i've actually seen it uh, on a train in england on the toilet where it says please don't flush nappies sanitary towels paper towels gum old phones unpaid bills junk mail your ex's sweater hopes dreams or goldfish down this toilet on this one we see a street a broken street with a sign next to it it says just speed up a bit, you got this. Why am I showing you this? What are we doing today? Basically, first of all, we start off with a few definitions about humor and comedy. Then we look at the effect of comedy. What does comedy do? And I've also included some fun theory about how to create a punchline. I will show you a few tips and tricks how to do that from the comedy stand-up toolbox. And then we look into comedy in the community with some examples. There is also an exercise for you where you can try out some things. And at the end, as promised, we have Lynn Ruth Miller, the oldest female comedian. So since it's a lecture about comedy and humor, we will start off with definitions. What is comedy and humor? So we have here two definitions from the Cambridge English Dictionary. Uh, here, humor is described as the ability to find things funny, also the way in which people see that some things are funny or the quality of funny. Whereas comedy is described as a type of film, play or book that is intentionally, fun that is intentionally funny, either in its characters or its action. I also want to include this quote by Bob Mankoff. He's an American cartoonist, editor and author from The New Yorker. And he wrote this quote in The New Yorker, actually, where he says, all comedy is humor, but not all humor is comedy. Basically, as we can see, Mankoff describes humor as a much broader category of anything that makes us laugh, whereas comedy is just a form of professional entertainment consisting of jokes and sketches with the intention to make people laugh. So comedy is more scripted and humor is the, the, the broad thing. Then for the next step, I want to have a brief look at the styles of humor. You all probably have a, your favorite comedian, your stand-up comedian. Maybe keep that person in mind and we can see if, if we can fit that person into one of these categories. If you Google different styles of humor or comedy genres, you can find a lot. Some people define it into four, some people say there are nine or some go up to 20 categories. The list is endless basically. But in this lecture, I would like to um, analyze a few comedy genres just to give you a brief overview with some things that we work with later as well. One is physical comedy. It's slapstick. You probably know Charlie Chaplin or Jerry Lewis. When you fall over the banana skin, that is physical humor. Or a lot of YouTube videos are also physical humor. You know, these videos at a wedding where somebody falls into the wedding cake. 
all these things they're based on physical humor you don't need words to make people laugh then there is self self-deprecating humor this form is used quite a lot in stand-up comedy but was also used by abraham lincoln who was a president of the united states in 1861 to 65 and he used it in a very smart way actually during the uh, lincoln douglas debates when douglas accused lincoln of being two-faced so he said to lincoln oh you're just two-faced and what lincoln did he deflected this criticism with self-deprecating humor and he said to douglas he said i leave it to my audience if i had two faces would i be wearing this one basically he makes fun about himself how he looks like and wins his audience back with that so yeah he's he's winning this situation by making fun about himself and uh, his appearance then we have another form of humor is the observational humor very famous also in stand-up comedy michael mcintyre if you watch him he has he's literally the master of observational comedy as well as ellen degeneres an example from Ellen DeGeneres, she has, when she says, oh, I ask people why they have deer heads on the wall. And they say, because it's such a beautiful animal. There you go. I think my mother is attractive, but I have photographs of her. So basically, she's just observing the situation and makes a joke about it. She has also a joke about a help hotline of the, you know, when you have shampoo bottles and you find a, a number that you can call on your shampoo bottle and she asks herself why do we have a number on the bottle of a shampoo and what would we ask them and even worse who are the people who are working in that call center so she has a whole um, comedy set about that which is quite funny by daily things that we observe just to to bring out the humor and the absurdity of these things then we also have another category is witty humor witty humor is using words it uses irony and sarcasm oscar wilde is um, an irish poet and playwright he has a quote here i have for you um, he says some cause happiness wherever they go others whenever they go that's quite a witty statement so that was an example for that then next style is dark humor dark humor usually involves a dark or depressing or taboo theme but by using this form of comic style the topic gets elevated and the subject is being made lighter but of course with dark humor you are very likely to polarize you know it's these jokes fall in the category of too soon or too far typical for these jokes are jokes about the holocaust 9-11 or right now with the corona crisis we have a, a photo of greta where she says the coronavirus we were meant to die from climate change so people said oh wow that's too dark can you say that so yeah dark humor definitely polarizes joanne rivers an american comedian she was quite old she's she performed until she was 80 i think she passed away a few years ago but she was famous for being very dark and she also received a lot of criticism. For example, she did a joke about Anne Frank where she said, uh, I'm nothing like Anne Frank. She lived in a walk up. I live in a penthouse. She stayed home all the time. I go out shopping. She then had to justify herself and she said, well, I, I, sh I do jokes about Anne Frank, but I do these jokes to make people remember what happened to her. So she basically defends herself by saying that process of bringing up her story or the story of Anne Frank that doesn't have to be serious so she can make fun about it just to keep the memory alive so that's open to discussion if it's really okay or not okay and of course you know in the comedy scene that I deal with I discuss a lot uh, with other comedians about rape jokes are rape jokes okay are they not okay is it too far, uh, especially after the Me Too movement, when we have, when it's out there, how oh, common knowledge, finally, how bad rape is. And then you still have comedians who do rape jokes and you're like, oh, my God, have they not heard the message? So, but basically the question is, what joke is too far and what 
it's not to find dark jokes are the jokes or the category where you can have a lot of these discussions. So, but now we go right to the next uh, slide. What does comedy do? Here I opened with a quote from uh, Victor Borge. He's a Danish comedian, a conductor and pianist. And he says, laughter is the closest distance between two people. I, of course, as a stand-up comedian, I mostly agree with his quote, but as we have just discussed with dark humor, I'm also thinking that a joke is not only something that connects people, but also separates people. Because especially when jokes are used to attack another person or to make fun of someone else than yourself. So self-deprecating jokes, in my opinion, are more likely to connect people than attacking than jokes that attack people. They polarize more. Depending also on the situation, because, for example, you have a lot of Trump jokes. So, so this is not self-deprecating. You have a target outside and all the Trump memes, or they obviously have a different effect than these dark jokes about Anne Frank. I have quoted a paper here, which is quite interesting to read. It's called uh, On Humor in Prison by Marlene Nielsen. And she mentions Hannah Arendt, the book from her, the book is called The Human Condition, where she distinguishes between the who and the what of human beings. And the example in there was that a humorous exchange between an officer and a prisoner is possible if they move from what they are, as in their official roles, toward, towards who they are and expose their personal unique qualities. So on the contrary, when the what takes over, the human togetherness is almost lost and the humor is used at the expense of someone else or of, of someone. So laughter, comedy and humor is not always perceived as a positive thing. And in this lecture, though, I would like to focus more on the positive side and discuss these things, what can be done with humor, why is humor used in the community, what are the positive effects on that. So here we have uh, why humor and there was a TED talk from Andre Tarvin. He has a TED talk about the skill of humor. That's quite interesting. He listed uh, a long list of things. It's actually longer in his talk. I took the first 10 points out. So he says why humor? Because humor gets people to listen. It increases long term memory uh, retention. It improves understanding. It aids in learning. It helps communicate the message and so on. The, the list is long. So it uh, brings people together here at the last point. And as you can see, humor goes much deeper than just being used for pure entertainment. It makes people think, it makes people listen, it improves understanding. And last but not least, it does make people laugh as well. And that has a physical reaction. A laugh has a physical reaction on our body. So laughter. Laughter is a form of communication. It is an emotional and a social signal. And it is quite universal. Everyone laughs. We in Austria, we laugh. In the UK, people laugh. In uh, Namibia, people laugh. So it's, it's quite universal, but it is used differently in different cultures. And you can find... A lot about the positive effects of laughter online, you know, laughter increases the blood flow, um, it massages the internal organs. I don't know what that means, but it apparently does. It burns calories, it reduces muscle tension, it also decreases the cortisol level in the brain, which uh, is a good thing. And also the study, a study has shown that people, that the pain tolerance of people who laugh before is quite is much higher than the one who didn't laugh before or in a in a low mood. Apparently, also the the body doesn't know the difference between a faked laughter and a real laughter. You know, there is also this laugh laughing yoga where you make yourself laugh because of the positive effects. I, as a comedian, um, I do know the difference between a real laughter and a faked laughter. So I'm, and I also find it actually 
much more much harder to fake a love than to really love because I think it's much more exhausting so I'm not sure if it actually reduces my cortisol level in my brain I think it probably just increases it when I try to fake laughing but this is a nice topic to maybe research at one point Someone also did a lot of studies on laughter. Uh, I quoted her here. Her name is Sophie Scott. She is a professor of cognitive neuroscience uh, from the University College London. And she talks about the different effects that laughter has. So basically, she also analyzes how it is if I meet somebody face to face, a person that makes us laugh face to face, or if you have face to face with a screen involved that we now all have due to the corona crisis so we all have facetime and all these uh, online things and then she also analyzes what how is the effect of laughter when you just have the voice or also if you just have the text and apparently with only text messages you get the least laughter and it increases and is most effective when you have real person to real person so real face to face and as we can see in text messages for example we things get quite easily misunderstood as well and very often you have to back your laughter up with either emojis or with ha 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 you know you have to describe your laughter and I agree with that because if we miss the body language and our facial expression and also the tone of our voice it is quite easy to misunderstand these things on the other hand, I also think in our society we are by now and probably after these months of, or hopefully not months, but weeks of isolation, we are quite, we are quite used to text messages and Facebook statuses and memes. So I think our perception of written communication has evolved. So of perceiving them and also of sending them out. I think we, we are quite evolved in that now. And uh, even when we think back about the street signs from before, you know, they, they mostly don't need an explanation. They don't need another human to explain it to us or tell it to us that it makes us laugh. I think we might want to share it with other people because I think laughing is a communal thing, a community thing. When you get something funny, you want to share it to your friends. And when your friends laugh, you laugh even more. So I definitely believe in that. Um... Yeah, so that the laugh is, uh, is something you like to share. Another effect of laughter, what I personally see I, when I facilitate business workshops. So I go to business workshops, I teach communication skills and presentation skills to HR people from whoever wants to pay me. And normally as a warm-up, I always do an improv exercise just to connect the left and the right brain, to be creative. And a lot of business people struggle with that. But what I observe then is that the people, they are overwhelmed with the task and they suddenly the whole room gets really quiet when they try to fulfill it. And then suddenly they start all laughing. So basically what happens when they are quiet, when they are overwhelmed, they all stop breathing, they all hold their breath. And with the laughter, they literally breathe in again. So it releases stress. It allows them to think again because oxygen comes back to the brain. So in stressful situation, laughter is actually quite helpful to release tension and to get literally fresh air into your brain. Maybe, maybe not at your next exam. Probably don't try it out there and just have a laugh. <laughs> but maybe just take a breath and realize that you can breathe as well. And laughter is something where you are forced to take in a breath. Here also, speaking of Corona, um, a message from Judy Dench. I don't know if you've seen that. She sends some laughter via Twitter to keep the spirits up. So, yeah. So she also encourages people to laugh. And other stars and famous people did that as well via Twitter. Okay, now we come to the fun theory. How to be funny. I have written out a few formulas from um, comedy writing books and uh, how is a joke made what is the joke formula so basically a joke is always a setup and punch then we have another quote from Judy Carter she's a comedy coach 
And she basically describes it in more detail. She said, you need an attitude. You have to have an attitude before, you know, if it's weird or scary. Then you need a topic plus a premise plus an act out. That is the joke. Then another one, uh, James Mandrinos, he is similar. He said, you need a premise, you need a point of view, and then you need the twist. So we can keep that in mind and can get back to that. Uh, I have another another person who gives us a joke formula. Her name is Tina Fey. She says, comedy is truth plus time multiplied by monkeys divided by one thought. <laughs> I, I like this quite a lot. But basically, how do you create a joke? How do you send a funny message? How do you set up this funny message? The main point is, I think, to think outside the box. So, and to push back the obvious. So, but first of all, you need you need a setup. Your setup is your story. So it basically is what we see. It can be the person on the street. And then the punch is the person sleeping on the banana skin. So the punch is a twist. And all these formulas that we just saw, they, they do that. They push back the obvious and they work with a good twist. Such a twist can be an exaggeration or it can be a metaphor. It can be a parody. It can be a, a shock or a surprise. A lot of comedians also do things in three. It's the not just comedians, also writers. So you always have to... Um, list three things and the third thing is something different the third thing is the twist um, yeah we, we can look at the joke I have a joke here for you that we can look at A says to B how do you want to die and B says I want to die like my father died quiet in his sleep not screaming like his passengers so what is here the joke basically the twist is a surprise because we the setup is um quite clear how do you want to die and the, the twist is a surprise because we imagine the fa father then in our story in our heads that he was in his bed and sleeping and it was all nice and calm but then with the twist it's like what he was actually in a plane or in a train and other people were screaming around him so that made the joke that is our twist and in comedy we are always looking for this twist Okay, so that, that we will keep these tools for later when we look at the exercise that we do afterwards. But for now, let's have a look at, let's bring it back to comedy in the community. So comedy in the community, we basically have looked at uh, comedy, humor, the definitions, the styles of humor and laughter, the benefits of laughter. Then now the question is, how can we actually use that in the community? And why should this be used in the community? As I mentioned before, comedy can not and humor, they can not only have a positive effect, it can be used to community, uh, to communicate, uh, how is it? It can also be used to communicate negative attitudes and prejudice. And it can go against certain groups, as we have seen with Joan Rivers and her dark jokes against Anne Frank. So... We can relate this to the social identity theory that's giving you distance between you and a different group. And basically it widens the distance between you and your in-group and the other group. And humor then strengthens the in-group bonds and fits within the group with the same identity. So for example, the, the same identity would be sex, gender, race, profession, sports, teams. But the question is now, um, when and how does comedy in the community work? First of all, you have to define your community. You have to define your group. You have to define the group you want to reach. So you have to look at what do we have in common? And um, as with well-known communication frameworks, you have to think of, you have to think about the messenger, you have to think about the message and the audience. In comedy, I have to do the same. Doing stand-up comedy, I have to do have to think, who am I, where am I gigging, and what will I say? So, for example, doing a comedy gig on the countryside rather than in London, I normally talk slower because some countrysides have never seen a comedian from another country than England, so they don't understand my accent. 
And in a big city, it's easier to be understood with an accent because almost everyone in London has an accent. Generally, I try not to change um, my material too much, but I try to change the approach to my material. So basically, if I have a message to deliver, I adapt the humor, not the message. Here's actually a short clip of my comedy set, but this was actually in London, not in uh, on the countryside at the Top Secret Comedy Club. Yes, I'm actually the most famous comedian in Austria. <laughs> I'm also the only comedian in Austria. <laughs> yeah, I hope you all understand me. Yeah. If not, I have printed copies of my jokes with me. <laughs> They're in German. <laughs> We can work it out together after the show. <laughs> Let's have a look how comedy and humor is used in the community. And maybe also start with the humor that gets people's attention. First of all, I brought up this, this video I want to show you. It's an example from Air New Zealand. So you know, every every time you go on a plane, they basically show you uh, this uh, safety video. And normally in smaller planes, the crew members show you the safety regulations and they put on the masks and the, the swimming vest and everything. In bigger planes, they show you a video of how to use a life jacket. And most of the time, nobody's watching it because everyone has seen it and it's boring and nobody really wants to watch it. But it has an important safety message. But the audience is literally mostly not interested. So then what Air New Zealand did, they reshot the safety video in a quite funny way. They reshot it as hobbits. Welcome aboard this Air Middle Earth flight. Before we set out on our journey, I would like to impart a story of safety. Even if you fly with us often, be sure to keep a sharp eye on the briefing. Make sure your belongings are hidden away in the compartments above or under the seat before you. All travellers must keep a watchful eye on the lighted signs and follow crew instructions. If the seatbelt sign is on, sit yourself down and fasten your seatbelt quick smart. Be sure that it's snug across your hips, though not so tight as to lose the feeling in your legs. If you're in a sky couch row, there are special seatbelt instructions in your seat pocket. We recommend keeping your seatbelt fastened throughout the journey. Should you need to explore, it can always be undone. If an oxygen mask should fall before you, simply pull down on the mask, place over your nose and mouth, and tighten by pulling the elastics on both sides. Oxygen will flow through the mask automatically. If there are young ones around you, be sure to put your mask on before helping them. Keep a sharp eye, as there may be others who need your help. Should an emergency occur during takeoff or landing, place your hands on your head with your elbows on the outside of your thighs whilst keeping your feet flat on the floor. You can also brace yourself on the seat in front of you. Precious. In business premiere, sit upright, put your hands on your knees with your knees together against the wall and your feet on the edge of the ottoman. If you're seated in economy and premium economy, you'll find your life jacket under your seat. The sky couch has it in the top of the leg rest. And if you're seated in business premiere, you'll find your life jacket here beside you. Life jackets are simple to master. Take a firm hold and rip it from the bag. Then place it over your head like so. Clip the straps together and tighten. This red tab inflates the life jacket. So only pull it once you leave the aircraft. Oh, sorry. If you need a little more inflation, simply blow into the mouthpiece. We shall provide life jackets for the very young, should the need arise. There's no smoking allowed anywhere of any kind on this aircraft, as it's a fire hazard. Should you need a light and darkness to help you find your way, the escape path lighting will lead you to an exit. If ever there were a need to evacuate, support fellow passengers who might require help. Your noble crew are now pointing out the exits. 
you would be wise to note your nearest exit could be behind you. So cast your eyes about and count the number of rows to your nearest exit. You'll find more information on the safety card in your seat pocket. Please power off all electronic devices during takeoff and landing. Electronic devices such as mobile phones can interfere with aircraft systems and must not be used in flight unless you've switched them to flight mode and ensured that all cellular, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capability is turned off. Once switched to flight mode, all electronic devices must be turned off for takeoff and landing. And finally for takeoff, we ask that you place your tray table back, your leg rest down, ensure your seat back is upright unless you're in business premiere where you choose your own seat back position. Check to see that your window shades are open and your armrests are lowered and be sure to fasten your seat belt. Once the story has concluded, your entertainment screen and remote control need to be put away for takeoff. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy your journey. May the road rise up to beat you and your bed grow ever longer. May the sun shine warm upon your... Fly, you fools! <laughs> The question here is, did it get attention? And I can tell it for myself. I was actually on a plane one time when they played that, that video. And it was really funny because everyone was watching. I've never seen so many people watching this video. Everyone was laughing. So we felt we are an audience. We are all surprised. And it felt quite connecting as well because nobody expected that. And that's a, the question also, why is that funny? Because nobody expects that from an airline you know and it's a very uh, it's an information that needs to be presented as a safety information but it's presented in such a different way that it's that it's really uh, has the element of surprise so here we see how comedy is quite powerful to get your audience attention if you just change a little bit you suddenly have the attention and you bring your safety messages through with changing it into hobbits. Here also another example of getting attention. On the one on the one side you see the, the normal sign elderly people. Do cars slow down? Do people watch out for them? Mostly not because you see that sign and you still drive through. Then you have this sign with the crazy elderly people who run over the street, which is quite funny. And then maybe you laugh and you're like, okay, I actually slow down because you're aware of that. Then we have also a sign of from homeless people where you can see this guy at the bottom. He said, I had an affair with Hillary Clinton. Now look where I am at. Or this other one says, uh, need dollars for penis enlargement, wanna be porn star. So what does it do if you see these signs? And are you more likely to give money or are you more likely to walk by as with other homeless people. So, and then also we have uh, Corona, obviously. The Corona, uh, you probably have gotten also quite a lot of memes and funny videos and things. I think my WhatsApp was spammed with it. You see the eye mask, then in, uh, here we also see the in a casino in Las Vegas, instead of money, they use toilet paper, or then the pilot here, it is your pilot speaking. I'm working from home today. So these memes are quite uh, quickly spreading quite quickly, quicker than the coronavirus itself. <laughs> but basically, what does it do? What, what does it do for rules and regulations? And for if we go back to the uh, New Zealand uh, airline, I personally think that laughter relaxes and it it relaxes your muscles and for rules and regulations and all these do's and don'ts when i see them me personally i don't want to follow them because i don't want to be told what i'm allowed to do you know you get rebellious rebellious and yeah even even in austria i see it with the coronavirus you know my grandmother she stays at home all the time but now she has to stay at home, the government told her to stay at home and suddenly she goes out. So I think in general, people don't like to follow rules and regulations. We have to to a certain point, otherwise we would all be in jail. But there is always a bit of a or speed limit. Do we really want to follow it or go a little bit over it? All these things. So then the question is, 
first of all, why is that? Why are we resisting some of these rules and regulation? And is there a way to communicate this message to people like my grandmother in a maybe funnier way that will make her stay at home? And I think if you have funny message, messages for regulations, it it's more likely for me personally, I'm more likely to follow them. For example, we had all these speed signs in the beginning of the lecture. I would probably slow down when I see this one with the uh, speed humps when children are around or something. I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> that is quite dark. Um, it makes me laugh, but then I slow down. That is the question that we can bear in mind if we want to communicate the message, how creative do we get and uh, how do we get attention and how can we con how can we communicate rules and regulation in a way that we really get to people's get to the ear and to the mind of people so now at the end or almost at the end i want to show a few things um, about comedy in the community we had uh, the example of street signs and rules and regulations and also there are some organizations that use comedy in the community to work with certain people in the community and one one of the we have here is called laughter on cold uh, laughter on call it was set up by uh, its founder and comedian danny klein modisette Modiset. so she's american and her mother has Alzheimer and she has seen that her mom really benefits from comedy care and ever since then uh, Danny has been working with other comedians and uh, with shows and with 101 visits and care sessions with comedians and Alzheimer patients because she she saw that that really connects the people and that makes people laugh and gives them the attention they need in a light way and a quote of her she says here she says uh, at laughter on call uh, believes in the power of comedy to help bring people together especially in tough circumstances and i'm actually supposed to work with them i should have started working with them but unfortunately the corona crisis started but what happened now they started to shoot short videos for alzheimer patients to keep in touch with them even if it's just on the screen yeah and then we have another uh, company uh, a non-profit organization it's called red noses the clown doctors it's now the clown doctors international it's actually a company founded by an austrian by monica Kuhlen. And what do they do? Clowns are visiting children with disabilities or children in hospitals or elderly people. And they focus, the focus of their visit is to reduce anxiety and fear and uh, by taking away the focus from the medical procedures. So they say basically the, the clown visits is important to, for the recovery pro process of the children and to bring their natural playfulness back in the much needed um, environment of a hospital by now they have uh, they have as we can see uh, 379 professional trained clowns and they have over 500,000 uh, patients and operate in 10 different countries so that's quite uh, big they, that already got quite big now the question for you the exercise i wanted to give you I wanted to make you think, how can you use this lecture? How can you use comedy in your life, in your work? How can you communicate your message with humor? And for that, I think it's it could be good if you have a think of your work, of your research proposal assignment or a presentation you have to give in the near future. If you really sit down and think, what is the message you want to deliver and how could you use comedy? for that delivery so really you think what's what's my message and how can i make funny how can i make it funny how can i get the attention of people what comedy style do i have to use what look back at the joke formula and have a look how can you twist it how can you surprise it how can you how can you be playful with it 
what would be your one-liner or your meme or your, your video clip even? This was the end of the lecture. Now we have the Q&A with comedian Lynn Ruth Miller. Before we get her on, I will show you a little a video of her comedy that you can see what she's doing. I'm Lynn Ruth Miller and something wonderful happens to me every morning. I wake up. <laughs> I'm 84 years old and I started thinking about what I want to be when I come back. <laughs> I thought maybe I'd like to be a pro prostitute. What do you think, Georgie? A prostitute? <laughs> of course, it's pretty dry, but I thought I could try it. That's getting dicey. The police want discounts. Yeah, they all want discounts. Well, they give me 10 minutes up here because they think that's all the time I've got left. <laughs>The thing that brought me into comedy, as pretty much everyone knows, is I was writing a story about a comedy college in San Francisco. And in order to write the story correctly, I decided to take the class and discovered that I had a knack for it. I was 70 years old and um, I found something that I truly loved. And so I went after it. I didn't know at the time that this was not a profession for uh, old people, it was not a profession for women, it was not a profession. I didn't know it was a profession. I just knew that I absolutely loved it and I was going to do it again. And I loved the idea of making my own sh sh jokes. And I like comedy. Uh, one of the things I love is just going to the comedy shows. I love to hear people be funny and I like to be funny too. So that pretty much tells you how I started. I started when I uh, was 70. Uh, when I finished the course, I continued. And um, I was in San Francisco at the time. I was actually living in Pacifica, which is a little coastal town right side of San Francisco, right outside of San Francisco. And when I discovered that nobody wanted me, because nobody did, and I still face that in London as well, um, a great deal. Um, and when I found out that no matter how good I was, uh, nobody said, still didn't want me, um, I created my own shows. And I uh, started with Winter's Bar, which was a redneck blue collar bar, uh, where I was the first Jew they ever saw. And, um, and the, the thing that I did that was different from other people who run shows is I paid my comedians. I always paid my comedians. You never perform for me for nothing, because I believe if you give me a show, you deserve the money more than I do. You're giving me the show. So that's what I believe. Comedy has given me a life. Um, before I did comedy, I was a journalist. Uh, I'm alone. I've lived alone since I was 25. I've always had a lot of dogs and cats, but I live alone. There's nobody in the house. And I do not have supportive family. As a matter of fact, my family is very negative. Um, so my very existence was defying them. Um, so I was very much a loner. I lived totally in my head. And if you look in this video, you can see, I also paint. Uh, you can see painting pictures. You can see pictures all over the place. Um, so that's what I did uh, before this. I painted pictures. I walked my dogs. I was a feature writer because I have a master's degree in journalism. So I um, interviewed people. But I never really had any kind of interpersonal relations. Once I started comedy, I started meeting people for lunch. I started dressing in pretty clothes because I read Steve Martin and he says always drink, always dress better than they do. Um, I became a person. Um, I, I was too afraid of people before comedy. But once I did comedy, people people laughed at me. They laughed with me. And it was a gift. It was an amazing gift. Where do I see it going? I think, I think, because I've established myself fairly 
much as, as a competent comedian. Uh, and I'm finding the people who appreciate what I do. Um, the big ones do not. I will never get in the comedy store. That man doesn't think I'm funny. His audience can laugh until they change their underwear and he doesn't care. It, uh, he doesn't think I'm funny. Um, there are so many of the bigger ones that do not ever even answer my emails, despite the fact that I've won awards and that I have tapes that show that I can get comedy. But I'm finding the people that do appreciate what I do, and I'm finding the people that that realize that underneath my comedy is a message, and the message is women can be anything they want, and you sure as hell don't need a pretty face to get it, because I lost my pretty face many, many years ago. You don't even need makeup. You don't need anything but a clever mind and an open heart. Uh, so comedy totally changed my life. I, you would not know me, those of you who know me now. You wouldn't know me. I was a recluse. Uh, I was a, a hermit. And I was, uh, I didn't know how to carry on a conversation because I never had to. So comedy has done that for me. Uh, comedy is a blessing for me. Uh, what's the role of comedy in uh, the community? And I think that it's terribly important. Comedy is like the little boy in the emperor's new clothes. Um, we're the ones that point the finger at the ridiculous preconceptions and, and crazy ideas that people have uh, that don't that are meaningless. I'm, I'm thinking of the people that are running around with masks on now, uh, busy breathing in their own moisture. And if they've got the if they've got the virus, it's going to keep reinfecting them because of their masks. Um, I'm thinking of of the way that we, as as observers of the of the society, can can make fun of the things that we're doing that are uh, ridiculous that don't make sense. Um, we're the jester in the king's court. Comedy is one of the few places where you can be politically incorrect and uh, get away with it. And I think it's terribly important because you need to jostle people out of their complacency. You've got to stop people from simply accepting what people are saying. What's the one about you? You have to drink water every 15 minutes. That's ridiculous. You're going to be sitting on a can. You're not going to, you're not going to be living a life. You're just going to be sitting on a can. So um, comedy has that function. I think it's vital. I think it's very important. So I see my role as being uh, brave enough uh, to say these things and point the finger. Um, for me, uh, my message and the thing that I am always doing is telling you that, that age is not a, a break. Uh, age is not stopping you. Uh, your, your own attitude is stopping you. Um, if you have health problems as you age, uh, you, you go around them, you compensate for them. One of the things that's interesting because of this uh, coronavirus thing is I'm talking to so many young people who suddenly have all kinds of physical issues because they are at risk. Well, the elderly do too, and it's, it's no different, it's no different. So my role in, in, in comedy is to convince people that people my age can be funny, people my age can relate uh, to things that are important to you too. Uh, people my age are viable. Uh, people my age have valid opinions, not based on experience, but based on the very same things, not a long time experience. In other words, not because I've lived a long time, but because I'm living now, because I'm observing society and observing, um, I'm observing uh, what people are thinking and trying to make sense of it. My job is to is to verbalize all that so that people can see things in a new light and can, for me, have hope that they, they do not have to end their lives when they end their job at 65. They do not have to end their lives when they can't walk as fast as they used to. They don't have to end their lives when they're not having sex five times a day. It actually is giving them a little bit of extra time to use their minds and their minds and their hearts are the things that make the most difference it has nothing to do with your face or your genitals. That's a very good question. I think laughter is a tension release. 
release thing. I think that laughter prevents heart attacks. I think laughter prevents um, stress. It prevents strokes. Laughter, laughter is the thing that makes us suddenly uh, relax and love who we are and love where we are. Uh, so if I can make someone laugh, and the thing that makes someone laugh is the sense of ridiculousness. When we can point to the, the re sense of ridiculousness uh, to you and you get it, that's when you laugh. That's when you laugh. I do send a serious message uh, with my humor always. I've just discussed it. Uh, but my message is, is that I'm viable and that you can be viable too. Uh, it's a very serious message. I'm, I'm fighting ageism every time I get up and take that microphone. I am fighting it. And I'm fighting it in a much stronger way than these articles that say, oh, you should respect your elders. Oh, you should listen to your elders. Oh, you should, oh, you should. That doesn't do half as much as having people see somebody who's 85, 86, please, 86, having a hell of a lot of fun. So that's where I think my serious message is. And the message that I send in my shows, of course, are that uh, aging is fun. And that aging, the way you age is a choice. That always, uh, I always want that to get across. You can choose. Because some people, frankly, really don't want to get out there and participate at 75 and 80. They're tired. That's fine. But I'm not. And you don't have to be. You can be, but you don't have to be. This was the lecture. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you got something out of it. If you have any questions or want to send me anything of your uh, from the exercise, how you tried to incorporate a joke or comedy in your work proposal, then you are very welcome to send it over to me. I'm sharing my email address online. <laughs> Hopefully that works out. If you have any other question, feel free to contact me. Yes, thank you for listening and have a lovely day. Bye.